You may be seated if you would turn with me to 1 John. 1 John, we're going to be looking at chapter 2 this morning of 1 John. I think most of you know that I enjoy reading. It's a little habit I picked up when I was in my late teens, and I still enjoy doing it today. And one of my favorite fiction books is The Lord of the Rings. Now, I read that book like 20 years ago. I was 21 when I read it. I know it's three books, but Tolkien originally meant it to be one book, so I'm just saying it's one book, okay? The Lord of the Rings, one of my favorite books. Read it when I was 21, but it still, after all this time, is maintained, so it's sort of up there first place of all the books that I've read. Now, it's hard to summarize The Lord of the Rings in a quick couple of sentences, but let me give it a shot. The The plot in The Lord of the Rings is that a little hobbit, a little person with furry feet named Frodo Baggins, comes into possession of the Ring of Power. Now, the Ring of Power was created or made by the evil Sauron. And Frodo, in the movie, the goal is, is to try and destroy the ring and try to protect the ring as he is on his way to Mount Doom to destroy the ring. Everybody with me? So, the ring of power has the ability to distort the will of that, those who possess it and those that are close to it or near it. Human beings that generally get around it want it. They want the power that that ring would give them. Even the little hobbits, though they are small in stature, nonetheless, they themselves are desiring to have it. And individuals will literally kill to get it. And once it is possessed, individuals will kill to maintain it. In fact, one of the main characters is an individual that was a hobbit, or at least hobbit-like, named Smeagol. Smeagol later becomes Gollum, after he possesses the ring. And the ring extends his life, but it also distorts and warps his mind and his physical characters. The ring of power, which is a destructive force, starts destroying and warping Gollum. In fact, the individuals that possess it, that is the ring of power, treasure it so much that at times, even when they're sit around, sitting around doing nothing, they will have the ring, pet it, and call it my precious. This morning, I want to talk about desires. And not that desires are bad, because desires aren't the problem. The problem is the object of our desires. This morning... We're going to look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and we're going to investigate our own desires. What is it that we love? What is it that we desire in this life? If you are there, if you would, please stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. Again, I'm going to be reading verses 15 through 17 of 1 John chapter 2. John writes, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, some translations say lust, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. My translation says the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride in possessions. It's not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let's say a prayer. Father, I pray this morning that not only would your spirit speak through your word, but that your spirit would start molding our wills to desire you above anything else in this world. May we long for you, may we hunger for you, may we thirst for you for you more than any other thing. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So you guys know that we are fallen human beings. We inherited this fallen nature from Adam and Eve. 
who sinned in the garden and this fallen nature has been passed down from generation or person to person to person. And because we live in this fallen state, we, in this fallen state, naturally have desires that are counter to the will of God. At times we have priorities that are skewed and manipulated or distorted from what they should be. But that should not be so as followers of Jesus Christ. We should seek to live as Eugene Peterson, the pastor that passed away a couple of years ago, says, we should all seek to live this subversive life, that is, seeking to work against, by the grace of God and the grace of God alone, against that sinful nature that draws us away from Christ, subverting the culture, seeking Christ. Well, this morning I want to take our passage here, and I want to look at three different points that I'm drawing out from the three individual verses And I want to talk about the love of the world, the damage it does, and as well how we overcome such dire states. So let's look at verse 15 again, if you would, with me. Do not love the world or the things in the world. My first point this morning is that simple. In verse 15, I don't think I can put it any better. Do not love the world. First of all, before we even get going in this thing, we need, to, we need to pause for a second. When we see this word world, W-O-R-L-D, we need to know what is John talking about? What does he mean when he says, do not love the world? We're going to talk about love in a minute in my next point, but in this point I want to talk about world because we know that there's, John also says in probably the most popular verse of all of Scripture, John 3.16 that God loved the world so much, he gave his one and only son, his only begotten son, right? So if God loves the world, what's wrong with us loving the world? Well, John uses this word, world, 23 different times in this letter of 1 John. It comes from the Greek word cosmos, which we get our English word cosmos from. So what is John talking about here? It's mentioned 23 times, and it's different each time it's mentioned. It all depends on context. We can do this in English, right, as well. Words depend on context, like the word can, C-A-N. I canned a can of pickle cans. You, You can use can in various different ways in English. You can use words in very different, various different ways. It's about the context of the word. So here, what is the context of the word world? Here, John seems to mean, with the word world, a system of ideas and values that are counter to Christ. So it's it's a mindset that is counter to the way Christ has called us to live. That's what he seems to mean by world. He doesn't mean that we should hate the mountains or the little birdies or the trees or, or people, because people are part of the world too, right? He's talking about a mindset, an ideology, a culture that is counter to Christ. That's what we should not love. And then notice what he says here in the second sentence of verse 15. And I want to brace you real quick, and those at home as well, that I'm about to say something that's going to step on toes. I know that. I get that. But I think it's borne out from the passage here. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, in this passage, it is clearly black and white. I will be the first to admit that there are things in Scripture that are just gray, that we just don't really know, whether it's certain doctrines, secondary or tertiary doctrines. There may even be certain ethical or moral dilemmas that it's a bit gray in Scripture. There's also a lot of black and white, but there are some that are gray. Here, there is no in-between. John says, if you love the world, you don't love Jesus. It's that simple. So do you love the world? Well, if so then you don't love God. You don't love Jesus. You love Jesus? Guess what? The reverse seems to happen here. It's transient. It, that means that you love, don't love the world. Now here in this passage, that's, that's difficult because as I'm studying this, and I told this to a couple of guys earlier this week, as I'm studying this, here's what I see. 
I see in my own heart that this scares me. Because in my own heart, at times, to be honest with you, I'm sitting here thinking, well, there are times that I do love the world. But I also want to say I love Jesus, right? Like, there are times that I am dealing with things that are of the world. Loving them, desiring them in ways that I shouldn't. But I also want to say that I love Jesus. So how do we sort of mesh these two? And I think the key is that we define what love is. That's going to be key here, but I'm not going to do that to my next point. What I want to draw out here in this point a little more is this idea of loving the world. And I want to draw it out by noting that if you love the world, you don't love the Father. The love of the world and love of the Father are mutually exclusive. You cannot have both. And I want to draw out some application here that might step on some toes, but I'm going to do it anyways. I think it's borne out in Scripture. And I think you'll see that as I walk through some of my message here. Sin can be deceptive. It can be so deceptive that at times it can make us think that good things, or brother, that bad things, rather, are actually good. Even at times it can make us think that good things are bad. It can be Deceptive in that it can worm its way into our hearts and minds and distort the way that we think and distort reality, and we don't even realize it sometimes. As a matter of fact, many times we generally think that sin is going to be like this full frontal attack, right? We're going to be able to see it. It's coming. We can tell when it's coming. But really, it's a little more subversive than that, a little more underhanded, Many times we generally think of Satan, he's going to be working these massive, huge things, right, in our culture. He's going to be working his way in the government in such a way that it's going to distort our religious freedoms and take away certain religious rights that we want, and that may happen, and Satan could do that. But the scary thing is, is that sometimes individuals focus so much on Satan, possibly distorting and warping our government, and they miss the underhanded, subversive stuff that he's already doing within our culture. And he's been doing it for 100 years, if not more. Family, traditional family values have been eroded in our culture. Understanding marriage in the way that God intended and the intimacy that's meant for marriage is completely thrown out the window today. No one thinks about that. Even times Christians don't think about that. The sanctity of life, whether it be regarding racism or abortion, either way, these things are thrown out the window in our culture. And many times we're worried about this boogeyman in the government that's going to come and get us. When all along, Satan's like, yeah, you keep keep worrying about this little scarecrow that I'm putting up, but I'm going to destroy you from the inside out. Sin is deceptive. And another way that sin seems to worm its way in, specifically in regard to loving the world, in a way that we got to be careful with, I know I do, is that times we tend to mask or cover up our materialism and greed with Christian or American platitudes. In other words, we cover up our desire and longing for toys and possessions with God has blessed me. I'm living the American dream. Now, am I saying that possessions are wrong? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying the desire for them, the priority to want more and more and more, and it never satiates that thirst for more and more stuff, more and more material gain, and in the end, you're still never satisfied. And you're laying here in your deathbed. And you're thinking, what did it give me? I have 20 cars. I have 20 jet skis. I have 20 houses, whatever. I have all this stuff. And it may not even be individuals that are rich. It may be individuals that don't even have that much money. But we long for more and more and more. And when we get it, when ultimately it's materialism and greed that has taken root in our hearts, we want to justify it by saying that... I'm just being blessed by God. Now, granted, God does bless us at times by providing a job for us, providing resources for us, providing a house so the storms like last night don't make make us cold and wet, providing cars so that you can drive here, whatever. God does provide that. It's not the stuff 
that's the problem. It's our attachment to the stuff that's the problem. And this desire and attachment to our precious. But we'll do whatever it takes to keep it, to protect it, to maintain that security. And all along, our desire and longing for Christ is being pushed back more and more. We have to be careful, very careful with this. One of America's greatest inventions is not the computer, is not electricity and all of the things that we have with electricity, the TVs, the phones. One of America's greatest inventions is that we can easily create a religion in our own image. To justify our own sin so easily that we can walk around in sin without any guilt at all. That's what loving the world does. But notice the second point here. Worldly love is an affection for the ideas and values that are counter to Christ. Look at verse 16 with me. For all that is in the world, and then John summarizes it, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is, from, is not rather from the Father, but is from the world. Now, here's where we need to pause and ask, what do I mean by this word love? Or really, what does John mean by this word love? Because again, at times, I find, I don't know about you, I'm only speaking for myself because I'm the worst sinner I know. At times in my own life, I find that I'm being pulled in many different directions with certain possessions and certain material things and still loving Jesus, you get the idea here. So what does John mean by love? You will recall that in a message a few weeks ago, I define love as an affection that wills for the good of another. So love is this affection towards something that wills for the good of another. And I think we can take that definition of love and apply it here. To love the world means to have an affection for the ideas and values that are counter to Christ. An affection that you hope that these values and ideas grow, succeed, distort minds, distort the culture, that people accept them more and more. Now, when I talk about love in that sense, I think most of you start saying, well, no, I'm, I wouldn't say that I want that. Sometimes we may act like we do, but we don't really want that in our hearts and minds as followers of Jesus Christ. At least, I don't think most of us would. The love for the world is an affection to see the things of Christ be minimized in our culture and see the things of the world be elevated. That's the love for the world. Again, desire here, before I go on to these three qualities of sin, desire is not a bad thing. You, you can't help but desire, right? Some of you, your stomachs are growling right now and you're ready for lunch. At home, don't leave. Stay on your couch, wait till I'm done, all right? You're hungry, you desire. There's nothing wrong with that. The Whitakers got us some beautiful strawberries Friday and man I cut those things up and I was pigging out on them yesterday and Friday night and I was I love there's nothing wrong with desiring that it's not desire that's the problem it's the object of our desires so here's three qualifications here three things that we should not desire notice the first one is desires of the flesh what is John talking about here with the desires of the flesh most seem to think that John is talking about some sort of sensual, lustful gratification. In other words, it is a distortion of what God originally meant with the intimacy between a human or between a, a, a man and a woman, distorting it in such a way that it's taken outside of the order and the confines of a marriage, and it's being manipulated and distorted and twisted, and you get the idea. So one of the first desires that we have, and we would just be really blind or 
halfway during our job if we overlook that this is a major issue in our own culture. We know it sells in our culture. We know what's really going to get the clicks and the viewers in our culture, and so do marketing folks and advertisers. They know what's going to get it. This sensuality sells. According to John, that's something of the world. And desiring that outside of the confines of a marriage is sin. But then the second thing here that I want to hit on, and this one, I want to camp out for a moment. So there's the desires of the flesh, and then notice this, the lust of the eyes or the desires of the eyes. What is he talking about here? Here John is talking about looking away from God into darkness. Now let me pause here for a second. Because some of you may be thinking, y'all with me here so far? Some of you may be thinking, well, I don't want to desire the things of the world. I want to desire Christ. So how is it that I keep from desiring the things of the world or loving the things of the world and instead love Christ? What do I, what do, I do? How do I work that out? The way that we do it is, is by focusing on Christ, not the things of the world. Now, I know that sounds, that sounds a little overly simplistic. I get it. But think of it like this. If you're here, in Arkansas, and you have a road, let's just hypothetically imagine that there's a road. One way on the road leads to New York City. The other way on the road leads to LA. If you wanna to go to LA, you can't go toward New York City. Are you with me? So the way to go to LA, guess what you do? You set yourself that direction and get the moving. That direction, LA. And the closer you get to LA, guess what? The farther you get away from New York. And that's the same thing here. If we want to get over the love of material things, we don't do it by sheer willpower. You can't do it in and of yourself. It must be the, by the grace of God. We don't do it by just saying, oh man, I'm just going to build it up. Someone slap me in the face. It's like getting ready for a boxing match. I'm going to battle with sin. If you go to battle with sin, you will lose. Sin is massive. It's huge. It's Goliath. But you ain't David. Jesus is David. And Jesus slain or slew or whatever the word. He killed the giant. And we're the Israelites that are scared to death because we can't defeat Goliath. And when Jesus kills Goliath, we follow in his footsteps right behind him, free from sin. You see how that works? You can't overcome it on your own. By the grace of God, you overcome it by looking to Jesus. And when you look to Jesus and love Jesus, as noted in verse 15, if you love Jesus, what do you not love? The world. You love the world, what do you not love? Again, it's black and white in the passage. I mean, the, the language, even in the Greek, is clear. You don't love Jesus. Do I see how this works? Okay, so the lust of the flesh, looking away from God, looking into darkness, and then the pride of life. The pride of life is pursuing and it's pursuing and boasting in our earthly gain. We got to be careful with this in our own life because it's really easy in our own life to sit back and look at all the stuff we have and say, look what I did. <laughs> look at all the stuff I got. Look at the house that I have. Look at the vehicles that I have. Look at the toys that I have. Look at the money that I have. Everything I did. Look, I worked hard for that stuff. But saying that is a complete mis misrepresentation and distortion, misunderstanding of how it is that you got that in the first place. Now, every single one of us has passed by an individual on the side of the road, begging for money. Now, I'm not saying you, you should give them money that's between you and God, whatever you want to do when that's instance. But here's the deal. I don't know about you, but when I drive by the past those people, here's my first thought. This is the sin that I battle. I'm better than him. I'm better than her. I work. I got a job. I got a wife. I got three awesome kids. I got a house. I got a Jeep. I got, I got, I got, look at me, look at you. I got a shower and a bed. But what I don't realize in that sin is, is that everything that I have is simply by the grace of God. And if God didn't want me to have anything, boom, tomorrow he could put me out on that street corner myself. 
The pride of life is when we just sit back and think that, look what we did. Look at the degrees I have. Look at the accomplishments I have. Look at the things that I've done. And we all think that it's us. And God played no part in it. That's pride of life. Those are the three desires that John mentions, or at least qualifies, that trip us up and are representations of loving the world. Now, Augustine took these three qualifications here, and he claimed that they were three different types of desires or lusts that Jesus was tempted with in Matthew 4. Many contemporary commentators take what um, Adam and Eve dealt with in Genesis 3 specifically. You can even see it in Genesis 3, 6, and say these are the three types of desires that they dealt with when they ate the forbidden fruit. All of that may be true. And it's an interesting pursuit. But here, what I want to focus on is is that all of us, all human beings, deal with these three desires. No one is exempt. I use myself because I'm the greatest sinner I know, again. But I know that everybody deals with this. And we must be careful. Because when we give in to those desires and lusts, we are loving the world. And we need to be careful. The next point that I want to draw out here, and my final point is this. All who desire the world attach themselves to it and will pass away. But all who attach themselves to God will abide forever. Look at verse 17 with me here. And the world is passing away along with its desires but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, when I'm, I'm thinking about this point in this passage, here's the, the biblical story that came to my mind, and it's what I read earlier during the announcement time, and Charlie talked about it in his Devo on Thursday up on social media. And it's the story that's mentioned in all three synoptic gospels. It is the story of the rich, young ruler. Now, think about this with me for a moment. If you had an individual come up to you and ask, what must I do to be saved? That's basically what the rich young ruler is asking. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be saved? Most of you, all of you, I hope, with me and everyone else that's a follower of Christ would generally say something like this. In a nutshell, repent, believe in the gospel. You'll be saved. Repent, believe. I find it strange that Jesus didn't do that. And it's mentioned, this story is so popular that it's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Jesus didn't do that. Jesus said, oh, you know, obey all the, all the commandments. The rich young ruler said, oh, I've done them all. Every single one of them I've obeyed. Now, Jesus knew that he hadn't obeyed them all. And he was going to pick out that sin and show, he was going to expose his true heart here. And then Jesus says, okay, good. Now sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. Now I know he was rich and ain't none of us rich. I get that. But track with me here for a moment. If Jesus came up to you and asked you to sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and follow him, what would be your response? I'm only going to be honest with you. As I was thinking about this the last couple of weeks and preparing this message, my thought was, I don't think I'd do it. I got a family to feed. I've got bills to pay. I got to get to work, right? The rich young ruler probably had a family. He probably had bills to pay. He probably had to get to work. So what is Jesus getting at here when he tells this young ruler, this rich young ruler, to give up everything he has? I think what Jesus is getting at here is he's getting at the ultimate meaning of faith. I know, it seems like I just came out of left field here all of a sudden with this, but follow me for a moment. I think Jesus is getting at the ultimate meaning of faith. We use that word faith, pistis in the Greek, a lot. It's in scripture 
all over. We believe this one is saved by faith, right? John, in this letter with 1 John, only mentions faith one time. 1 John 5, 4. One time. But I think here in this passage in verses 15 through 17, and Jesus, when he's talking to the rich young ruler, as well as in Luke 9, 23, when Jesus says, you must take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me, I think what they're doing is they're giving us a qualification or an understanding of what faith is. Faith is an allegiance to Christ. Faith is a surrender to Christ. Faith is giving your Life, you're all to Christ. Attaching yourself to Christ and live rather than attach yourself to the world and die. The essential idea here is is that if indeed you want to live, if indeed you want to be saved, it comes by following Jesus But we know that you can't follow Jesus in and of your own strength. It's only by the grace of God. It's only by God giving you the ability to do so. Have you attached yourself to Christ? Do you have an affection that is undue for the things of this world, the possessions of this world, the positions in this world? I'll end with this illustration. This is a true story, though I don't know where I heard it, and I don't know to whom it applies. But there was a college professor that was approached one day by his dean. And the dean came to him and said, look, we got an issue with your class. So, all right, what? Well, everybody in the class always does really well. Everybody always gets A's. And in most institutions, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I, I mean, I can vouch this is very much true. I've had higher-ups in academia tell me the exact same thing. Um, in, in most classes, they don't want everyone to score A's. For accreditation purposes, they want a broad spectrum, A's, B's, C's, D's, and some F's, so that they know you're doing the broad middle road. So they said, everybody's scoring A's. You've got to make the class a little harder. And the professor said, well, I thought it was pretty hard. But okay, I'll make it a little harder. And that's not, you know, you can make classes hard or easy. So he said, okay, I'll make it a little harder. So he did. Guess what happened? Still yet, everybody gets A's. So he thinks, well, I don't want the, I don't want the dean to come back to me again asking me to make it harder. So I'll just go ahead. I'll go ahead and make it harder on my own. So he does it. Guess what happens with the next class? Everybody gets A's. And so the dean, instead of going to the professor, decided to go to some of the students that were in the current class course he was teaching and and talk to them about what was going on and he said so so would you guys consider this an easy class and the students looked at one another and said this is the hardest class that I've ever taken in higher education I've never had a harder college class and the dean says well everybody always does so well in the class why does everybody always get an A if it's so hard and they were pretty honest at this point they said well We all love the professor. We love him dearly. And we don't want to disappoint him. So everybody's just getting an A because we want him to be happy for us or proud of us. At times you may think that the way to overcome the material world is to by just working up the gumption to hate it enough where you walk away from it. But that's not the way this works. If we're not to love the world, we're not to be attached to the world, the way that works is that we love Jesus and we focus on Jesus. And as that love grows, because of our affection for Christ, our affection for God and his things, we will naturally obey and do what he wants. So I'll ask you this question in conclusion here, and then Jennifer's going to come up and Lead us in a closing song, and Chuck will give the benediction. Do you love Jesus, or do you love the world? There's no middle ground. It's one or the other. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word being so clear. 
And now we pray that you just pour out an abundance of your grace so that we may do that which we are commanded to do. Love Jesus and not the world. Help us to understand the benefits of being attached to Christ and the cross rather than being attached to the world and the things of the world. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus, I've forgotten the words that you have spoken, promises that burn within my heart have now grown dim. With a doubting heart, I follow the paths of earthly wisdom. Forgive me for my
Remember Angie Hewitt? Remember Jersey? And remember the family of Susanna Morphew as they continue in their search for her up in Colorado. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we're so grateful for the mercy you've given to us through Christ, for the grace you give to us, for that God-given desire and power to do your will. And Lord, we know that of all the battles that we face, the biggest challenge that's in front of us is our own fallen nature. Help us to love you more than anything, for you're worthy. In Jesus' name and for your glory, amen.